Hi, this is Misha, and for this 4th of July, we thought we would revisit the old original AR-15s, often called retro ARs. Of course, today, retro is starting to kind of mean anything pre-2000 or pre-rails. But in my hands is my trusty old SP-1. This one was made in 1965, so it has quite a few early features. In fact, this one is now CNR eligible. So as years go by, we'll see more and more CNR eligible AR-15s. I picked this one up because it does have a lot of early features. The M16 is a very interesting gun in how it was adopted. You know, it kind of goes back to World War II. One study showed that a lot of engagements took place at 300 yards or less and that a lot of soldiers didn't necessarily even fire their guns. It was also concluded that automatic fire didn't actually lessen accuracy and, and hit kill probability so um, you know it wasn't a detriment so on and so forth well in 1953 armor life was founded and that same year they hired a gentleman called melvin johnson who we'll, we'll look at a little later we're going to get to the 1941 johnson rifle pretty soon but what's interesting about Mr. Johnson there, from the 1941 Johnson rifle, he brought over a seven lug rotating bolt. Well, the following year, they hired a gentleman called Eugene Stoner, who was pretty much instrumental in putting a direct impingement type gas system into what was then the AR-10 chambered for 7.62 NATO. So you've got uh, Johnson and Stoner working on the gun Early on, Johnson had more to do with it, but quickly Stoner would uh, make a lot of changes and, and really update the design. Well, in 1956 and 1957, the US, uh, U.S. military was trying out replacement guns for the old M1 Grand, and um, Armand was able to get the AR-10 into the trials. However, it didn't last long. It was a very early prototype. It wasn't near as developed as the T-44, which would become the M14, or the T-48, which was the FNFAL. Well, basically that barrel burst, and that had a lot to do with the George Sullivan, the president of Armalite. He insisted that they use a barrel that was actually a, an alloy. It was an aluminum with a steel liner, whereas uh, Stoner insisted on using a, a, a steel barrel. As it turns out, he was absolutely right. So that disqualified the AR-10. But a lot of people saw it, a lot of the generals and the staff saw the, the new lightweight rifle. And um, so in 1958, there was a um, small caliber, high velocity program in the U.S. military. And basically what they were wanting, they wanted a 22 caliber gun that fired an automatic that weighed about six pounds and that was capable of penetrating a steel helmet at, uh, at some distance. And Armorlite was encouraged to scale down their AR-10 to make what would become the AR-15. And um, Remington got in it and changed up the old 222 caliber cartridge, made 223 Remington out of it. And Winchester also got involved. Specifically, they were making some barrels early on for Armorlite. So Armorlite partnered up in a little bit. And uh, yeah, by late 1958 or mid-1958, the AR-15 was out. There was a prototype. They were tested in Alaska. They didn't do very well. It's a big thing. You know, Stoner claims that the tests were rigged against the rifle. Evidence seems to support this. You know, so some of the military were pushing for it. Some of the military were dead set against. So it was kind of controversial. Wasn't sure it was going anywhere. So in, in December of 1959, Fairchild, the aircraft manufacturer, who owned Armor Light, sold off the AR-15 to Colt. They were tired of dealing with it, they just they, they weren't sure it was going to make money. Well, Colt picked it up immediately. They changed a few things and they kept doing this throughout the 1960s. The main thing Colt did though, they knew how to market the gun. By 1960, just a year later, you had Malaysia placing an order, the British SAS were interested, and actually Eugene Stoner himself quit Armalite and went to work for Colt so he could help develop the gun. So 1960, things are looking good. I mean, they're, they're definitely getting more attention. That year, General LeMay of the Air Force ordered 80,000 of the new Colt 601 rifles. And 
and uh, that was the first production model of the rifle. But this was blocked by General Taylor at the Pentagon, who convinced Kennedy and others that the military didn't need two rifle cartridges in service at the same time. So in 1961, there's this back and forth between some generals, and I'm, I am paraphrasing, I, I know I'm, I'm not an expert on this, I'm just trying to give a very brief accounting of what happened. There was a lot of political back and forthing, but um, yeah, you can see there. So that for in 1961, the AR was looking, but then Project Agile began, and what Project Agile was, they sent, Colt sent originally 10 of the early 601 rifles over to Vietnam. Now these actually had Winchesters <coughs> with a one, uh, excuse me, Winchester made barrels with a 1 in 14 twist rate, which gave a very unstable 223 projectile. Well, the, the people over there, they, they liked its wounding characteristics, and, um, how it worked out. It was very positively received by the South Vietnamese and the Americans who tested it. So a thousand more were sent over to Vietnam in 1962. Also in 1962, the Colt 602 came out, and what the basic difference, and there are a lot of small differences, these guns changed up. For example, the early 601s would have brown or green furniture that was painted, but um, in 62, the 602 came out, and the major difference there was it had a 1 in 12 twist rate. The reason they went to the, the tighter twist was to try to stabilize the bullet just a little bit better so they would get better cold weather performance. Remember, this was the Cold War, right before the Cuban Missile Crisis. They were concerned about combat in Alaska against Soviet Russia. So, you know, worrying about how a gun performed in, in the Arctic, not a bad, you know, not, not, not stupid of them. Well, that year, the U.S. Air Force adopted the 602 as the M16. So we have, we have official adoption, finally. And the following year, the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, actually ordered an end to M14 production and said, no, we're not going to buy any more once current contracts are up. The last contracts were ending in 1964 and 1965, and he wanted to go to the M16. The gun was cheaper to make, faster to mass produce, it was a much more modern gun, lightweight, more compact. And it had it was actually able to be fired in full auto, whereas the M14 was a monster in full auto. So by 1963, you see this happening. 1964, the U.S. Army adopts an experimental version known as the XM 16E1, which was the same as the Air Force M16 at the time, except it had a forward assist, a teardrop style, which we'll look at in just a minute. So that's what happened there. So 1964, these guns go into production. You start to see major orders. The Army orders 85,000. The Air Force orders 19,000. So we've got over 100,000 in military service. Also in 1964, this rifle here comes out, the Colt SP-1. This is the first commercially available semi-automatic AR-15. Now, they did actually make a couple of dozen in 1963 as pre-production, and they also sent one to the ATF for approval, but 1964 was the first production year of the SP-1. They made about 800, so not a large number. This one here, as I said, is from 1965, so the subsequent year. It has a lot of early features, which is why I picked it up and started the muzzle. We've got an original three-prong style flash hider. Still on half by 28 threads, which are still in use today. We have a 20-inch pencil barrel with a .625 diameter. This is not chrome-lined, nor does it have a chrome chamber. It has a 1 in 12 twist. It's marked MVP, the M standing for magnetic particle tested. They started doing that in 1964. P is just a proof. Remember, these aren't chromed. This has one of the early forge sight bases. The, the very first guns actually had casts, but they went to forgings early on in 1964. But as you can see, the flashing here is actually machined off. It's smooth. Same in the back behind. The flashing's gone. We have a standard A1 front sight. There's no drain hole under here. 
standard M16 bayonet lug, which is still in use today. This front sling swivel is held on with the roll pin, which they were doing early on. This sling swivel itself is rubber coated. The early, early ones from 62 to 63 were still metal, but they went to rubber coating quite early on. These are early so-called no drain hole hand guards. They're made out of kind of a mottled Bakelite type material. This has an early, early carbon steel gas tube in it as well. We've got the straight slip ring here, which would remain in service. We've got a slick side upper receiver, no forward assist, which is what the early guns were in the Air Force guns. We've got an A1 style port door. Now this does have the large uh, .320 diameter front takedown. Originally, all SP1s came with this, a double-headed screw. None of them actually had a 601 style push pin. But I hate that double screw, so I put a 601 style pin. I can't remember if this one was made by Heat and Beat or someone else, but I, I like the look of it better. It definitely makes cleaning and you know maintenance easier if you need to take it off because those double screws can be a bear. Still six side here. This has a, a plus. Uh, I think I the wrong side. This has a plus on the lower, like the military guns would. No fence around the mag release. I'll put it back over here, just a straight release here. So there's no uh, bar here for the takedown pin because you don't have a detent yet on these early guns. Internally. Strip this out. We've got a relatively early mag in this one too. That's the this, this silver gold color. I was looking for my Nodak reproduction waffle mag, but couldn't find it when I was doing this video. I'm sure I stuck it away somewhere for safekeeping. I'm sure no one else does that, right? Lose something when you try to keep it safe. Internally, we have an early style bolt carrier. This has a Parkerized carrier. All SP1s except for the pre-production ones in 63 had Parkerized carriers. The military guns in 64 and early 65 would still have chrome carriers. This has an early style round gas key. It's got the early machined pin here instead of a cotter. It's a split pin with a kind of a nail type head. We do have a chromed bolt. These early guns, they did not cut them back under the firing pin, like later Colt SP1s would be. This has an earlier style firing pin too, what's called the improved uh, flathead. But they did cut the back back a little bit, not as much as on later Colts. You can see most of the back is still intact, but they did cut off about half an inch, quarter of an inch there, just enough to say it's not a full auto carrier. And this is a slick side carrier, as you can see, there's no serrations for a um, System. Put that back in. This has an unnotched hammer here, if you can see it on camera. They didn't start notching them until later. Most interestingly, if I can get this guy out here, if it wants to come out today. We have an early buffer called an edge water. This is a solid buffer made out of aluminium. It's very lightweight. It's either aluminium or titanium. It's very light. And it has a floating head that agitates inside to keep it from recoiling as much. But it's a very light buffer. They would have problems later because of these. They were just so light. But it's interesting. You don't see many edge water buffers these days. The tube itself is also different than a modern rifle tube. In, inside here, and obviously I'm not going to take the buttstock off, but <coughs> internally it doesn't have wrench flats on the end. It actually has holes in the front for a tool to unscrew. Also, there's a roll pin right here. You can see that on camera. 
that goes through one side and the other, that actually the, the receiver extension of the buffer tube is roll pinned into your lower receiver. This also has a hole in the safety you see right here. The early parts, both your takedown pin and your safety, were had these little dimples in them or holes. That was kind of an artifact of the early manufacturing style that, um, that Armor Light used. My, my takedown pin isn't dimpled because this is as in 1965, so they weren't, they were using up old parts, and that's what you'll see with the SP1 line throughout. Colt will use up old parts that they can't use in the military guns any longer in the SP1s, you know, waste not, want not. So when the military adopts a new part, you'll see the old parts appearing in the SP1 six months to a year later. Here's the other side of that roll pin. Has a Bakelite or modeled style early grip. These grips are just slightly contour different than your standard A1 grips. They're just a little bit different, especially at the base. It's made, this has the early style buttstock, which is solid. It has no trap door for a cleaning kit, just a rubber butt pad here. And the rear sling swivel actually rotates. On my gun here is a late style M14 sling, which is what was used on the early M16s as well. Yeah, this is an SB1, and this is a good representation of what an early Colt 602 or 604, which was the Air Force designation without Ford Assist, from 1964-1965 would look like with the early features. Yeah, we'll start. We're starting here with this gun. It is a very light, very smooth gun. But it's not my daily shooter. These are getting quite collectible today. So this is unfortunately mostly a collectible, but good old SB1, light and simple, very trim gun. Yeah, these started to go into theater in Vietnam in 1964 and 1965, and uh, well, we'll pick up the story on from there in just a second. We'll move on. Well, as I said, in 1965, the XM-16E1 military, uh, Army designation, or M-16, Air Force designation without the Ford Assist, started to appear in theater in Vietnam, and um, there were problems. Mostly you had failure to extract. And there was a big congressional investigation over this, what was going on. And as it turns out, they switched from ball, I mean, stick to, they were using stick, they switched to ball powder. And they were doing this to try to get a leg to more range, it burned a little hotter, and also they just had a bunch of ball powder they wanted to use. And what that did, it put increased parts where it made the guns foul up faster, dirtier, burning hotter, and therefore you had uh, failures. So obviously they switched back. Another problem that they had, Colt originally had marketed the gun as uh, not needing to be cleaned. Obviously it does. So another solution was simply to send over cleaning kits and manuals showing soldiers how to clean them. You see a lot of changes with the XM16E1. Now this one here is my A1 example. It's not an E1. Although late E ones and early A ones look exactly the same. In '65, started to change stuff up. This is the teardrop forward assist that was originally introduced in '64. Once they discovered the problems, the old edge water buffer disappeared, and the standard rifle buffer we know today came about. And I've got a blog article on that has a point by point detail on when all these changes happened. So feel free to check that out for, for more info. But they, they switched the buffer. Another change that happened is the military okayed the use of a parkerized bolt carrier group in 65. So first the chrome bolt carrier disappeared and then soon after the chrome bolt head disappeared and went to the modern parkerized style. Also the split pin the mill machine split pin was replaced by a cotter pin, the one we know and love today, and the modern firing pin appeared. So the bolt group changed. Interestingly enough, the little cam pin never changed. 
too much and was always parkerized. They started to add drain holes to things like the front sight, base, the buttstock screw just to let water get out so it wouldn't build up pressure and cause problems. Quite late, in 1967 or so, the A1 birdcage flash hider appears, replacing the old three prong. Several reasons for it. The birdcage is stronger, also it won't catch on vegetation, so on and so forth. It's kind of hard to say, you know, go from one end to the other because they, they did all kinds of changes. For example, first they changed the, the gas tube from carbon steel to stainless steel, and then later, around 69, they changed the bend in it to the modern bend we know. The furniture would change quite late in production to more of this uh, matte style. The hand guards would, would receive what they call drain holes, but some actually say it has nothing to do with that and more to do with manufacturing. Either way, the in inside of the hand guards changed a little bit. <clears throat> We've got the modern A1 style pistol grip appearing. But yeah, the XM16E1 would be standardized as the M16A1 in February of 1967, implementing all the changes that they um, figured out. One of the last ones it seems like they did, they started chrome plating the chamber. Well, when they did that, the barrels went to be marked MPC and then later CMPC, C standing for Colt. So, you know, the barrel markings will change to indicate this. Still using 1 and 12 twist with the pencil barrel. In 1968, some soldiers were quite a, there was a study conducted asking soldiers in Vietnam if they preferred the um, M14 or the product improved M16A1. <coughs> and overwhelmingly, soldiers said they preferred the M16. After all, for jungle warfare, it was lighter, handier, full auto was actually an option. We were still using 20 round mags at that time, but you know, compared to the 20 round mags of the M14, you can definitely carry a lot more ammo, and it was much more controllable than full auto, more practical. So the M16 was actually, despite you know some early problems in 65 and 66, in the late 60s was, was becoming very accepted and, and quite well, well done. Well, some of the last changes that were done, the A1 buttstock was introduced in 1970. This has a trap, excuse me, a trap door for the cleaning kit, which most of you know today. It also has a fixed sling swivel. This no longer rotates like on the E1 style buttstock, or known as the Type D. Now we're under the Type E stock here. And one of the last changes to come in 1971, we would have a chrome lime bore. Originally they were marked MPB and then later they would actually change that to MP chrome lime bore around 1974. You'll start to see Colt marked or C marked parts around 1969 because both H&R and Hydromatic started to make M16 type rifles too. So by the late 60s we have three manufacturers of these they're going into mass production. You know, a lot of the early features are dropped. We have the standard buffer. The um, we have the standard rifle tube inside. It's no longer being roll pinned in. It, pretty much, it's 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 familiar to most modern shooters who you know they are 15. The parts are the same. Still, have, of course, the good old classic triangle handguards. It's still a lightweight weapon. A little bit heavier in the butt stock now because of the cleaning kit and the the heavier buffer being used, but still a light gun. This one has a forward assist, so it's going to have the serrations on the bolt carrier, but worth noting, the U.S. Army purchased the Model 603 with the forward assist, and the U.S. Air Force would continue to purchase one without the forward assist called the 604. But 604s would still have serrated carriers, because why have two different parts? Having them there, even if you don't have a forward assist, is not a problem. So, you'll, you'll see that starting around 1966-67, slick side carriers disappear. Just a little note, you know. I find retro building and, and learning about what was used quite fascinating. This particular gun here, this is actually a surplus upper that came from the National Guard. They did phosphate it black, I didn't do that. 
and it does have an A2 port door for some reason. I'm sure the original one got bent and they just replaced it in the 80s. This is a Nodax Bud A1 lower. Everything else was original Colt. The lower parts are mostly all Colt. Got a Colt, what's called a red wine buffer in it, A1 butt stock. So, you know, I tried to do a pretty close replica. This was one of my earlier old style guns. I wanted a Vietnam style AR. I like it. Nice gun, fun to shoot. You've seen this in seen this in other videos of ours. Yeah, that is the A1. You can tell they by 1970, 1971, these pretty much became standard and you won't see any more changes. But at that point, we have a lean, mean, product improved gun. This has an early, what's called a seatbelt sling, too. It's made of this nylon material like a seatbelt would be. I have a few accessories over here, too, to go with it. Let's see. This is an early mag pouch. This was actually a general utility type pouch, but you could get four mags in well, but it's too deep. So what they would do, they would put rolled up socks or something else in the bottom to let the mag sit up a little more. And that's exactly what I've done here. I put an old pair of rolled up socks in just so the mags would sit properly. I always find pouches interesting. This is an early type utility pouch. Later on, there we go. That was made of the cotton too, or canvas. Later on, they would go to a purpose-built type pouch that holds four 20-round mags. You can see it's not as deep, and the mags actually stick out enough where you can pull them out. And you go to a typical snap hook you're used to today. share those when I found them. This is a bipod for the M16. This is actually for an E1 because it stores a cleaning kit in the zipper pouch right here. Because if you remember the E1s don't have a storage compartment in their stock. But um, this is a very simple but usable enough bipod. Out today. It just clips on to your barrel. Not terribly useful. But and it will scratch your barrel, so I'm not going to put it on mine. <laughs> I just have it as a collectible. These aren't expensive or anything. And this only fits the original .625 diameter. It's too too small to lock on completely to an A2 style barrel. We have a canvas belt pouch with, that holds your bipod and your cleaning kit. Of course, more gear, more weight, you know. I'm sure in Vietnam that was... Completely welcome, you know, they had nothing else to do except skip through the tropical rainforest fun time. And, you know, who's ever going to get hot there, right? Tie carrying crap. <laughs> that kind of neat. Still has early style eyeless clips on it. It's a bit of canvas as well. And the star of the show, if I can dig it up over here, we have an M7 bayonet, the original knife type bayonet for the. Uh, 16. This is a surplus one I picked up about 15, 20 years ago. Just a bit of a thing as the table. There's your bayoneted 16A1. having a bayonet on an AR makes it but that much more vicious. I don't know about where you live, but here in Arkansas, drive-by bayonettings are a real problem. Yeah, I said I'd share a little bit of uh, Vietnam-era gear with you, why not? Yeah, this is my M16A1 replica on Nodak receiver, and um, this would remain the uh, standard issue gun in the U.S. military up through the 80s. In 1982, Colt would... Um, would go to a 1 in 7 twist rate for the new M855 round developed by FN. So, if essentially the old M16A1s would end in 82 and you go into a transitional period around that time called the M16A1E1. But yeah, now the Colt SB1s would continue. Now they would they would all have a slick side upper, they'd all have the large front takedown 
screw pin without the uh, the ridge here, the, the fence. None of them would have fenced lowers. So that's why my M16 replica is an early SP1 because the late SP1s aren't really like anything in military service. While Air Force guns from the 70s definitely had slick side uppers, they did have full fence lowers. So having a slick side upper and lower isn't really representative of anything. But um, they would use what parts that they were left over from military production. With the SP-1s, the major year is around 1968. If you get a gun made before 68, it's going to have mostly all the early features. After 68, the, um, the more A1 stuff parts would start to creep into the design. Also, they would cut back the carrier more and notch the hammer, so a few more safety things to make sure it's a semi-auto only, you know, that stuff. So. Um, but they would ramp up SP-1 production in the 70s. So most of them you'll find will be from the 70s or 80s because they made a lot of them. Estimates seem like around 300,000 total, and they would come out with a carbine version to go with the rifle as well. M16A1, we'll move on.